why don't we begin our Warforged character creation? I think we have some nice appropriate background music for it. And uh, also, I did I did get up and get a um, I, I did get up and get a drink. Uh, just make sure you put in a biohazard bag and dry ice. <laughs> uh, we are going to be having uh, we are going to have a cheer and an adult beverage together. Okay, a libation. Uh, tonight, I'm trying something called Crazy Mountain Amber Ale. And as you'll notice, it almost looks like an owl bear. As the, um, it almost looks like an owl bear. That's the art on it. Uh, however, if we look here, this character's name is uh, Seamus, an owl slash mule deer slash bobcat. Enjoy an introduction to the crazy side with Seamus, the oldest resident of Crazy Mountain. He monitors the quality of the river with a sharp or with his sharp eyesight so that only the purest water makes it into Crazy Mountain Brews. He's bold but agreeable and surprisingly clean. And since Seamus loves all food, be sure to join him for dinner. So here we go. Here is Seamus, the, um, the owl mule deer bobcat. And I also like how they made the uh, barcode look like a forest on here too. That, that's kind of fun. Koala, yeah, we're going to be... Um, well, doing something with them, they're going to be made available on our Discord after tomorrow's campaign session. Will I do something with the characters? Probably not, aside from consider them for the story we're going to build tomorrow for an Eberron campaign. I will upload them to our Discord so that if you like the characters, you would be able to download them and play around with them. And where you can find that uh, fluffy koala, there's an area, uh, it's a little hard to see here. There's an area called past content here. And if you load into it every week, uh, what I do is I summarize all the characters we build, the map, the campaign, all of that. And so not only do I put the YouTube video of that creation up, I also put the file itself. So here, if you want to see this character, Terra and Fair Isle, neutral female tiefling fighter, champion 15, acolyte background. Here is the YouTube of us making her together. Here is the character sheet that we generated on stream. And so all of this information is going to be made available to you. All right, so let's have a little bit of uh, let's have a little bit of ASMR with our can. Y'all ready? I know that was a loud sip. It is. It does have kind of a, a crispness to it, kind of refreshing. I don't know how. How would I describe the taste? Multi hoppy smooth. Eh, I'd say a little bit more crisp than smooth. Maybe multi hoppy. I think I'm picking up on in it. It's okay. It's a. It's a good solid okay. I don't know if this is the best microbrew I've ever had. I love the art on it. Hmm. Don't sip, take a gulp. Nah, it doesn't really have a bitterness. It might have a little bit of like a, a slight citrus or a sourness to it, but not in like a rotten, rotten kind of way. Hmm. It's definitely not bad. To my palate. You may have different opinions of different beers. 
All right. We are making an Eberron character, but we are still going to use our random uh, our, our random elements. We know we're going to be making a Warforged. And here's another mm, dilemma. Do you consider Warforged to have some kind of a gender? Are they androgynous and a Warforged is a Warforged is a Warforged? Does a Warforged have a feminine personality or a masculine one? And I'm not asking to stir up any social controversies. We're sticking to we're sticking to fantasy, we're sticking to D&D. This may very well be whatever, it's X or it just doesn't even have we're not even rolling. Still, Let's roll a percentile to see if we have a multi-class character. Depends if the Warforged soul was crafted from scratch or claimed and mechanized. I agree with you there, Santa. Especially with how I've homebrewed my Warforged. Not that I'm going to make this about me. I'm going to do the, the vanilla Warforged first. Depends on the builder and how they want it to be portrayed. So what we could do, how about this? Let's roll to see if we have a multi-class and possibly if there is uh, an orientation of some kind, what could it be? 39. And it does mention for the Kalistar, you might have a male biological Kalistar character, but the soul, because they, they have two souls inside them, the soul could be a feminine soul from the past. Uh, creating whatever interesting, you know, quirks. If you've seen uh, Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine, you know Jed Zia Dax? That's kind of a Kalistar. And in a way, maybe a bit like a Warforged? <laughs> Zuler Pi says golems are Barbus Tevik. I don't I'm I don't understand that Zuler Pie. Kinda like a transformer. <laughs> Who is of the alignment? 8211. Hey, we have a we have a lawful evil. We have a lawful evil warforged. And we are gonna generate her or it at level let's see 43 level 11 oh gotcha okay Zuler Pie. I'm definitely getting the hops in this of the two possible um, ability score improvements that are available. Well, with the 33, both of them are going to be ability score improvements. <laughs> I got you, Zuller Pie. Don't worry. The background of this character is... Well, it's on a 13-sided die. One. Ooh, an Acolyte. This Warforged has certain personality traits now. 2d8 is going to give us a 4 and a 2. Then 3d6 is going to give us a 2, a 1, and a 5 as placeholders. <laughs> While we're talking about backgrounds, before we get to our class, as we scroll down here, Sorry, I gotta get to the Sharn part. <laughs> Why has this Acolyte Warforged come to the city of Sharn, which will be our adventure location for tomorrow? Aha. Number three. 
you're here on a pilgrimage seeking an audience with the head of your faith in Sharn. But the intermediaries have demanded a small fortune to set up this meeting. Interestingly enough, Blairod here that we made also um, is uh, is coming to the city along similar circumstances as an acolyte. Now, in addition to this, let's go back up, Marks. It's toward the beginning. We gave uh, we gave two of our characters regrets that are built into them, as to make them compelling and a little bit more three dimensional, or insert them into the, or to insert them into Eberron a little bit more fluidly. You can also give your character a debt of some kind. Now, the Acolyte portion does seem to do a good job of saying, well, why do you need 200 gold pieces? Let's roll, though. Maybe, maybe we have a very unfortunate cleric. Debt 5. Someone knows the whereabouts of a sibling or loved one you... Whoop, you thought lost in the morning. But that information is going to cost you. Our debt could be redundant with our acolyte reasoning for visiting Sharn, or it could be an additional debt really making our, our character that we're generating very desperate for money to both uh, get this information on a, an important person to her or it. Um, as well as, um, well, we want to see the higher-ups, and it's going to cost us. Maybe they're both on the same pilgrimage, or at least in the same caravan. Yeah, and you know what? This is going to be a strong uh, a strong link for our for these two characters. One may be chaotic good, and the other's lawful evil. Um, but they both share this begrudging goal. Now, here is something else that we can do. We gave a military background to Blarod because of um, um, because of this regret, indicating that uh, she engaged in military uh, in some kind of military conduct. Warforged were created in this hundred-year-long civil war called the Last War that happened in Eberron. I think then it would be appropriate to look at the military background uh, flavoring. Now, for an Acolyte, um, there is one that stands out here. And so if we wanted to come down here and go military background, this would be number six. You provided spiritual support to your troops. Were you always devout? Or did you find your faith on the battlefield? Their, their souls could be linked. I don't know. If we're the ones writing this campaign for our players who are playing these characters, what if um, what if the Warforged was a reclaimed soul and was actually maybe someone important to Blarod here? While you're serving your country, you did unforgivable things. What if we had it set up that um, that uh, the an unforgivable thing was to sacrifice a person as a as, as like a spy, right? Oh, you're from this nation. Well, I'm not from that nation, so yeah. If you order me to kill this person, please don't order me to kill this person. If you order me to kill this person, I'll do it to prove my loyalty. Kill that person. What if that soul was reclaimed and has come back in this warforged body? And what would be very interesting 
is because uh, Blood Rod of the Temple Scar that we made, because she bears this this kind of this crushing unforgivableness. She can't uh, look. I judge others harshly and myself even more severely. Being a changeling, she's she's actively pinching off that part of her brain with those memories because she doesn't want to remember because those memories are so tragic. We could come up then uh, that uh, as a DM that these characters are actually very intrinsically linked with each other and they may not even know it up front. Journey, hey, hey, welcome, man. I hope things are going well over on your end of uh, your end of the the D's and D's. So this is the military background specific for acolytes, and as you can see, it's already created a connection in a party of just four characters. We're making compelling characters, three-dimensional characters. Okay, we have our placeholders. <laughs> well, they're in place. It's time now to start looking at the mechanics of the character. And we're going to build the character's character first. Hey, brother, passing it forward. Journeyman, thank you very much for that. I I very much appreciate that. I hope that your illustrations are coming along well. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Journeyman does some really awesome art over in his channel. And uh, he is working on a couple of projects, one of which is he's doing um, all the art for a Lamentations of the Flame Princess module. Um, but you've also done a lot of art for Valiant One. Ah, run, follow me if you want to live. Um, you're, uh, you're also working on some, uh, on some other commission pieces uh, for some fifth edition supplemental things. And I mean, whatever else you do with your personal or spare time, such as I don't know how you, you have personal time, Journey. I'm sure you squeeze it in there somehow, though. Pat says, so she killed the person whose soul became the Warforged and feels guilt over it. Yes, and, and she's actively not remembering, Pat. Journey, thank you also for that host. Lend me your power, your strength. All right, being an acolyte, it's the first background that's up here. We are going to gain proficiency in insight and religion. We're gonna get two languages of our choice. So we have an acolyte language and an acolyte language. And we're gonna receive some equipment, a holy symbol A prayer wheel. Incense times five. Pocket, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy that creepy smile. <laughs> so we have our, our holy vestments and our, you know, our arraignments here. A set of common clothes. And a belt pouch with 15 gold pieces in it. Oh no, I tripped and now these bits are everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Pocket. Diodems is going in a journey into the woods here. An orc warband jumps out to try and assault you. Uh, advantage with that 15, nice. An 18 total, you defeat the orc warband. There's your experience points. Our background feature is Shelter of the Faithful. 
if you are attending your whatever your religion is, you're performing services or you're notable, you and some of your guests can be put up at a modest lifestyle inside the um, inside the the cloisters or the property owned by that faith. It is a really really good one, especially because it can it can get you um, a lot of healing and access to other spells that maybe you wouldn't have normally. Yeah, thank you. You hang in the good streams. Well, we have, uh... I do the same, and there's proof. There's some There's some very lewd tentacles uh, showing that, uh... We are both gentlemen of the highest caliber, Journeyman. <laughs> what are uh, what are uh, its personality traits or her? If you want to go with that bend, uh, four. Nothing can shake my optimistic attitude. Expressed through a, uh, a lawful evil way. Is this maybe... Well, I don't know if it's like a yandere. But can you, can you imagine someone with a personality like this? Extremely optimistic. Expresses themselves in a methodical, selfish fashion. And personality trait number two. I can find common ground between the fiercest enemies empathizing with them and always working toward peace death is a great equalizer <laughs> or force or something I, I know I'm going stereotypical lawful evil we don't have to do that here but as we're building the character's personality step by step can you imagine this character standing in front of you Journey can make characters stand in front of you. He does an excellent job of, of showing the character and expressing what we do with words, with a simple angle of an eyelid, with, um, you know, the rise, or the, the show of a tooth in a smile, or how dark a background is. So we got to work a little bit harder. <laughs> And, uh, and, and we got to type it out with words and make sure that we're spelling and doing everything correctly. Maybe like a megalomaniac. Let's look at her ideal. Number two. Charity. We must help bring about the changes gods are constantly working in the world. She is an agent of change. Follow her. She is a great equalizer. Or it, again, I don't know how, if you want to personify a robot. It's up to you. Her bond is one. I would die to recover an ancient relic of my faith that was lost long ago. Maybe her soul was reclaimed and put into this body to almost act as a as a, a, a fetch, you know, go get it. Maybe they don't care about her soul. I don't know. Let's look at her flaw. I will do anything to... Uh, there is our evil. I will do anything to protect the temple where I served. Would you... Would you murder people to protect your temple? Would you make them stop making noises? Because you don't like the noises they're making about your temple. And you have to turn the noises off. Make the noises stop. I'm the one who's been chosen to make the noises stop by the gods. Yes, people can't argue if the noises are gone. The noises have to stop. Make the noises stop. 
The noises must stop. Make the noises stop. The noises make make the noises. 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 Correction. Hello, and how are you? I hope you're having a wonderful make the noises stop. Make the noises stop. Make 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 the noises stop. Remix! Zuler Pie, speaking of robots, yes, we have personalities. Journeyman. Speaking of things like uh, D&D 5th edition supplements, The Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron has, oh, was released on Monday. And this is an... It's an official campaign setting with unofficial rules right now. Think of it like a giant playtest that was released in order for them to get feedback and balance and, and tweak things. So this week and next week, we are delving into the Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron and we're exploring the campaign setting. This week, we are making a four character party, one of each of the four unique races to Eberron. Next week, we're gonna be making a party which could include a unique race, but it'll take the standard fantasy races and apply the options that Eberron opens up to them. Could the Warforged create more Warforged with the voices uh, and have them serve the temple? Possibly. They must seize the means of production, Pat. <laughs> All right, so that's what we get for our, our background. Now let's go to chapter three. And take a look at what the Warforged have to offer. Warforged are formed from a blend of organic and inorganic materials. Root-like cords infused with alchemical fluids serve as their muscles, wrapped around a framework of steel, dark wood, or stone. Armored plates form a protective outer shell and, re and reinforce joints. All Warforged share a common facial design, with a hinged jaw and crystal eyes embedded beneath a reinforced brow ridge. A sigil is engraved into the center of the forehead. This is unique to each Warforged. Beyond these common elements of Warforged design, the precise materials and build of a Warforged uh, vary based on the purpose for which it was designed. A Juggernaut Warrior is a massive brute with a heavy steel frame, while a Skirmisher can be crafted from wood and light mithril, or mithril to grant it lithe and elegant movement. While they're formed from stone and steel, Warforged are living humanoids, resting healing uh, healing magic and the medicine skill all provide the same benefits to warforged that they do for other humanoids a warforged can focus its mind on its body as it rests adjusting its shape and form to assume one of a few defensive postures a warforged who expects heavy combat might focus on durability while during a time of peace they might be content to adopt a lighter less aggressive form uh, Victor, Eberron is an alternate campaign setting for Dungeons & Dragons. It's one that features um, a lot more magic. Magic is a very commonplace thing in the world of Eberron. In fact, they have skyships and trains, locomotives, etc., that run on harnessed elementals. Um, many of the populace knows of um, basic magic spells. Um people tend to be more educated um, so you'll find a lot more uh, tool proficiencies and skill proficiencies so it is its own it's its own world that can exist within whatever you think of D&D is Zuler Pie, this party of four is possibly going to crusade I think it's going to be very heavily religiously themed Zuler Pie. Pocket Punch says down with the bourgeoisie <laughs> a Warforged personality. I'm, I'm blocking that up here. Let's zoom in a little bit. The Warforged were built to serve and to fight. 
For most of their existence, Warforged had a clearly defined function and were encouraged to focus purely on that role. The Treaty of Thronehold gave them freedom, but many Warforged struggle both to find a place in the post-war world and to relate to the creatures that created them. The typical Warforged shows little emotion. Many Warforged embrace a concrete purpose, protecting allies, completing a contract or other pursuits, and devote themselves to this task as they once did to war. However, there are Warforged who delight in exploring their feelings and their freedom. Most Warforged have no interest in religion. Aha, so we might have a, a very unique one. Hence, these different circumstances we've been discussing. Make the noises stop. Make the noises stop. Make the, make the noises, make the noises stop. Most Warforged have no interest in religion, but some embrace faith and mysticism, seeking a higher purpose and deeper meaning. The typical Warforged has a muscular, sexless body shape. Some Warforged ignore the concept of gender entirely, while others adopt a gender identity in emulation of creatures around them. Now, we are also going to get a Warforged uh, quirk of some kind. The Kalistar get something similar with the, the second soul that lives inside their body. Here, we're going to roll a d10, and what is our quirk? Our quirk is number 10. War is the only thing that makes sense to you, and you're always looking for a fight. Although, I mean, if we want to go random, we can still work with this with what we've been developing. Though there's a quirk over here that might better express that make the make the you know noises stop. Maybe something like you often say the things you're thinking aloud without realizing it. Uh, you analyze out loud the potential threat posed by every creature you meet. You can have some fun with it. I think we can still roll with our our Warforged quirk number ten. Victor, uh, I thought it was going to be some kind of technological thing, judging by that cover art, uh, but it was, as I call them, Arcana. Yes, it is. So it, it's Arcana tech, Magitech, um, magical technology, whatever you want to call it, Victor. This is a, a fusion of those two um, concepts. Many more. Can I ask you a question? This might derail things. Yes, please, uh, Journeyman. You are welcome to ask as I'm presenting. I'm not just a. I'm not a lecturer. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting if I was like a D&D &D university uh, professor. However, ask away. This is an interactive community journey, man. Yeah, pocket punch, exactly. Small creature, dagger, no threat. And meanwhile, the, the halfling's like, excuse me, I could, I could poke you someplace. A warforge imbued with wild magic as a sorcerer would be so fun to RP. Robot running around with whack magic. Yeah, so it'd be kind of like, a, you know, system error, 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 and something happens. Have you ever played the D6 system like 80s Star Wars? Uh, the closest I came to a D6 system, I believe I played a game of Besom, B-E-S-M, that stands for Big Eyes, Small Mouth. It's a, it's an anime, anime-themed kind of universal roleplay system. Um, I think some people also called it Tristat. I haven't played GURPS, that's a D6 system, but I, yeah, so I don't really have a lot of experience with a D6 system, Journeyman. Uh, oh, King, is that a D6 system? Uh, Rissus? 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 Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, it, it seems like King may have, or others in the audience may have too, if you wanted to pick their brains. Alright, Warforged names. Warforged were assigned numerical designations uh, for use in military service. Many of them adopted nicknames, often given to them by their comrades. As free individuals, some have chosen new names as a way to express their path in life. A few take on human names, often the name of a fallen friend or mentor. 
However, if you want to look at some example, here's some Warforged names. Anchor, Banner, Church, Crunch, Dent, Iron, Pants, Red, Spike, Vault. Oh, that's right. Mate is a D6 system. That's true as well. I forgot about that, Dark Wolf. Yeah, Mate RPG is a D6 system. All right, as a Warforged, our Constitution score increases by one. A typical Warforged is between two and 30 years old. The maximum lifespan of the Warforged remains a mystery. So you know what we're going to do? Um, Blayrod is 25, presumably has been serving at least the last, I don't know, eight years. Uh, so we are going to have, we're going to roll a D8. And we're going to find out how old our, uh, our Warforged character is on a D8. All right. Well, King, if you thought our shifter was whatever you thought she was, our uh, our female Warforged is three. Uh, we are a medium-sized creature. They're between uh, five and six and a half feet tall. Weight and build are affected by sub-race, and we'll, we'll get to that. We have a walking speed of 30 feet, and therefore a climb of 15, a swim of 15, and a fly of zero. We also get what's called Warforged Resilience. You were created to have remarkable fortitude represented by the following benefits. You have advantage on saving throws against being poisoned, and you have resistance to poison damage. So we have advantages versus poisoned, and we have resistance to poison damage that we're putting up here in our, our resistance box. You are immune to disease. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. And you don't need to sleep and don't suffer the effects of exhaustion due to lack of rest and magic can't put you to sleep. That's a lot. Yeah, 12 is almost a granny to, to Warforged. Oh, you're saying in Japan? Gotcha. King thought she was a shifting uh, lady of the evening. Just saying. Uh, Victor, please, yeah, you can open up about whatever you'd like. Delcorin wants to be a Warforged. Bubonic. Uh, you just got the rigmarole at the department out your county emergency prep training. I almost had a... Have a... Oh, a conniption... When our instructor brought up this acronym, BKBS, geez, I asked, uh, what were we, three, uh, 13 years old in uh, Boy Scouts? Um, I'm not familiar with uh, with that one. At least it, nothing's coming to mind. I mean, if it's something that's not PG-13, then, I mean, you could elude if you wish, but that acronym itself isn't ringing any bells to me. We are also getting what's called Sentry's Rest. When you take a long rest, you must spend at least six hours in an inactive, motionless state, rather than sleeping. In this state, you appear inert, but it doesn't render you unconscious, and you can see and hear as normal. You also have something called Integrated Protection. Your body has built-in defensive layers which determine your armor class. You gain no benefit from wearing armor, but if you're using a shield, you apply its bonus as normal. 
You can alter your body to enter different defensive modes each time you finish a long rest. Choose one mode to adopt from the integrated protection table, provided you meet the mode's prerequisite. And so down here, you can make yourself lightly armored, medium armored, or heavily armored, depending if you have the proficiency for it. You can speak, read, and write common. So we have common and these two acolyte languages. And now we have uh, three different sub-races for Warforged. As a Warforged, your body was designated for a specific purpose. Choose one of these sub-races, Envoy, Juggernaut, or Skirmisher. So here we go. We're going to generate a three-sided die, and we're going to find out which body type we're getting. Three. We are a Skirmisher Warforged. All right, so here's Envoy, there's Juggernaut, here's Skirmisher. Your dexterity increases by two. Oh, we forgot to roll which class she's going to be. Whoops. How oh, well, I guess we'll find out here next. Your walking speed increases by five feet, giving us a 35 and a 17 and a 17. And we also get what's called Light Step. When you are traveling alone for an extended period of time, you can move stealthily at a normal pace. And there you go. So that's what we get for being a Skirmisher Warforged. Now, let's find out which class she's going to be. Bring, up, uh, bring this up again. We even left off here. Roll the D12. One. A barbarian. And an even barbarian? Uh, oh, a totem warrior. Okay. You want to know what's auspicious? You want to know something? Especially about the links that we've been trying to make between, our, uh, between the characters? Look at the very first character that we created. A berserker barbarian. Someone who carries these regrets shuts away me uh, memories after possibly doing something very tragic in time of war. And here, we have another barbarian, perhaps who was brought back from death and put into this body. I don't know, it's cool. When you open yourself up to this, isn't it fun seeing what can happen? Zuler Pie, some of us use, uh, oh, what the hell do those initials mean? <laughs> oh, bleach kills bad stuff, gotcha. Victor, you've not played D&D in four months. I am lost, and I'm the DM of the game. Well, Victor, if we can help answer questions, ask them. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel burdened. Uh, don't feel bad. It happens. It's fine. You have plenty of us here who, who are willing to help you improve your game and answer your questions so that when you sit back down in that DM chair, you'll be ready to run your game. Uh, oh, Pat, for some sound effects, gotcha. Uh, Seraph still talking to King about uh, the uses of goblins. Steel Dust, I think that if my current PC dies in my game, I'm going to make a Warforged Assassin. It sounds really compelling to have a character made to kill and be perfect at all, but wants to help fix the world now. <laughs> Bubonic One, like I said, Juggernaut gets a boost to armor class gained from those upgrades. It, you know, maybe in the third or fourth edition, Bubonic, but in the fifth in the fifth edition playtest, um, they they don't get that AC boost. Hey, Katie Sue. Oh, goodness. I'm sorry it took so long, but sometimes decompression after sessions... Yeah, it can. You had a session. You had a lot of fun. Have that table talk. Follow up. It's a part of the natural process. Uh, yes and no, Victor, to a degree. 
I've been running I've been running fifth edition since it came out, and I've been running the other editions past then. Look, there's things that I don't remember about uh, being a player character, and that's you you leave it to your player characters to help fill you in on how a mechanic works or something along those lines. Uh, hopefully, you can trust your players to do so. Okay, now it is time to go back over to our player's handbook and to take a look at Barbarian once more. We are an 11th level Barbarian, so these are the goodies that we're going to be getting. You throw a lot of homebrew into the module, so I wanted feedback from my players and I'm so happy they loved it. That, uh, what, what kinds of things were you altering? Uh, were you uh, were you just like reskinning monsters? Uh, did you insert a new NPC? And also, Katie, uh, Victor is uh, Victor's a little nervous about getting back in the DM saddle, and so I've I've asked Victor uh, to actually ask us any questions he has about getting back into the swing of things as a dungeon master. So if there's any advice you could help give to Victor, um, it please uh, please do offer it. Let's see, our proficiency bonus is 4 at this level. And uh, we are a D12 hit die class. And we have 11 of those suckers, because we're 11th level. We have proficiency with light and medium armor and shields. Simple and martial weapons. No tool proficiencies. Ironic for being a robot, huh? Our saving throws are strength and constitution. Our proficiencies in them, I'm sorry. Choose two from animal handling, athletics, intimidation, nature, perception, and survival. Let's see. Let's go back to the personality. You're on a pilgrimage, seeking audience. Someone knows the whereabouts of a sibling or loved one you thought lost in the morning. That information is going to cost you. You provide spiritual support to your troops. Um, war is the only thing that makes sense to you. You're always looking for a fight. Probably intimidation. Nothing can shake my optimistic attitude. I can find common ground between the fiercest enemies. Intimidation and animal handling actually sound like good ones for him. Imitation, I mean, for that kind of bully reason. Animal handling? Well, look. Yes, maybe the handling of animals. What if this character looks at humans, elves, uh, Kalistar, changelings, etc. as animals? You as a, you as a player might might be able to convince your DM. Especially because you have this kind of alien aspect. You have this outsider's aspect to culture and expectations. And of course, you're rocking this expression of yourself through this lawful evil uh, veneer. You might be able to convince your DM to use animal handling as a form of social interaction with, uh, with various people. Because you don't care if you sound condescending, like you're a good boy, and you know, and you pet someone for for telling the truth, or you make a uh, you make a uh, an offering of food in order to try and get information from someone, like you would offer, I don't know, a horse to stand still while you mount it. Wouldn't that be interesting? If uh, if you made this approach with this unique character concept, and you asked for animal handling to be a social skill. Hashtag just saying. Uh, by the way, sorry I uh, I missed the announcement. It was on my soapbox. Uh, thank you very much, um, Staffy, for joining our, our family, for joining our circle of friends here in our game store and uh, discussing D&D. Hybrid Drakes, uh, new cult-type villains, and a weird NPC tiefling demon hybrid. Uh, Pat, oh, yeah, you're still going through some uh, some DM burnout, huh? Well, you know what? Even if you don't have advice, Pat, 
um, you know, you could be the Jacob Marley and rattle your chains and, and whatnot and be like, don't let this happen to you. Make sure you pace yourself. Don't get in over your head. Uh, you know, a cautionary tale from someone who's been there or is there or even who's gone through the cycle a couple of times before. It is. It can be a cyclical thing. You can very much still be that inspiration, Pat. Kitty Sue at Victor, I highly recommend coming back in with a module. It was so helpful for my first time. And of course, you may be past level and already comfortable to run homebrew. But research into the lore and mechanics that PCs can do is the best that you can advise. Uh, Zuler Pi to a Golem or other classes are squishies, hence animals seems reasonable. All right, let's continue along. Uh, we get to start with a weapon, a great weapon of some kind, a great axe or any martial. For simplicity, let's give her a great axe. If you want it to be a great sword or a maul or something, we can change it. I'm, I'm just kind of filling something in right now. Two hand axes or a simple weapon. Um, let's see. What if we went with something like a, uh... Ooh, what if we went with something like a, uh, um... A light crossbow. And, and hear me out in this, too. I think we can make a strength dex con barb really well. And, you, and you'll say, but, but Matt, look. You have four skills in mental stats. What are you doing? What that would do is show that she is very physically robust. But she's really only good at processing those four trains of thought an explorer's pack and four javelins all right per barbarian we get to rage make the noises stop make the noise and can you imagine if a barbarian rages and just starts in sort of a in a repetitive but like a very mellow neutral tone just says stuff like that and that's how you knew that they were in a rage you know you get this big hulking six foot you know automaton coming at you just staring with unblinking eyes hefting a great axe and all the while it's staring you down getting closer all you hear in a in a, a, a in an almost polite very neutral tone is make the noises stop make the noises stop Make the noises stop. Make the no make the make 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 the noises stop. Ha! Huh, that's a rage. That's a mood. Unarmored defense. Uh, we will calculate that uh, once we get our scores in. Reckless attack. You get advantage for granting advantage. Uh, danger sense. Danger. 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 Um, it makes you a little bit more survivable, which, I mean, do barbarians need more survivability? Eh, sure, why not? We already have heaps of it. We'll get our primal path at uh, level 3, and we'll get some ASIs in us. We'll get an extra attack at uh, level 5, as well as fast movement. We get an extra 10 feet. So actually, woo, we're going to be rolling up on people. Um... We're going to be rolling up on people pretty quickly with a very large weapon. We'll get a Feral Instinct. Brutal Critical. And by 11th level, we get Relentless Rage. We can keep fighting despite Grievous Wounds. If you drop to zero hit points while you're raging and don't die outright... You can make a DC 10 con saving throw. If you succeed, you drop to one hit point instead. Uh, Katie Sue. Oh, I was curious if there's links to my game store. I think I heard that I have a game store. Yes, uh, I do have one. Um...
Uh, the website, the website, uh, probably best to do the, uh, the Facebook. Uh, whoop, wrong window. Here we go. So that is the store. Thank you for asking. D&D &D time, thank you very much for that host also. Uh, nope, we are in Ohio. Uh, Sandusky, Ohio, or as a lot of other people know it, we're at Cedar Point. <laughs> Okay, now we are going to get some some uh, Path of the Totem Warrior. Maybe, what if this is the religion? It's wanting to fuse uh, like technology and, and bio whatever, so you almost get like a Borg aspect or something like that. Makoki, hello, welcome back. Uh, we are going to get Spirit Seeker. Yours is a path that seeks attunement with the natural world, giving you kinship with beasts. Hence our animal handling. Hey, this works out so well, doesn't it? At third level, when you adopt this path, you gain the ability to cast the beast sense and speak with animal spells, but only as rituals. Also, we will get our totem spirit. When you adopt this path, you choose a totem spirit and gain its feature. You must make or acquire a physical totem object, an amulet or sim similar adornment that incorporates fur or feathers, claws, teeth, or bones of a totem animal. At your option, you can also gain minor physical attributes that are reminiscent of your totem spirit. For example, if you have a bear totem spirit, you might be unusually hairy and thick-skinned, or if your totem is the eagle, your eyes turn bright yellow. Hmm... Being maybe more of an independent person who's also a skirmisher, we should probably go with Eagle. We should probably go with uh, with Eagle for the, the totem. So we have a totem spirit, Eagle. We will also get an aspect... Eagle. Hey, Delcorin. What's in the box? What's in the box, indeed? Well, you tell me, man. Delcorin, do you want me to open up a uh, a uh, monster menagerie? Rage of demons. Elemental evil, or a box of the Storm King's thunder? A hairy warforged must look like a mossy tree trunk. Wouldn't that be something, Pocket Punch? Well, you know, uh, Pat, in this case, um, as it's manufactured, maybe having yellow eyes isn't unusual. But what could happen is that this Warforged found a connection with the natural world, despite being an alchemical, you know, creation itself. And so what if you see feathers growing in patches out of wood or metal? What if you see um, some... Maybe some sort of like uh, a talon, like a, a chitin, or a, you know, like a chitin material, growing out of wood or metal, to represent uh, claws or a beak. And slowly, the people who made this warforged don't recognize it anymore, as it is, as it is assuming more and more of a natural look to it, uh, being kind of disturbing. This fusion of artifice in the natural world, possibly driving it to to this to the state that it's in. 
what's on the cover of each. So here's a, here's a beholder, uh, kind of looking over a dude's shoulder and a lightning spell. Here's uh, some kind of two-headed demon, I don't know, like a Demogorgon or some other lame... You know, no one's ever heard of a Demogorgon or something along those lines, Delcorin. An angel against a tempest. And a giant for the Storm King's Fury. give it away. Well, Delcorn, unless you're going to donate another thousand bits, you got to tell me which one you want, brother. <laughs> Evens, Angel, Odds, Beholder? Odds it is. You're going to go for the Beholder. All right. Delcorin, this is your rare or large uncommon. Oh, wait. Was that the Evens Angel? Oh, Evens Angel. I'm sorry. Well, I didn't open the tape. I cut the seal, but I'm not going to peek. I'm sorry. Angel, you're right. Evens, 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 Evens. Blah, 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 blah. It's all right, Zuler Pie. I said blah, 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 blah. here because you rolled an even sixteen, which you clearly, unmistakably said was the angel on the cover. Clearly and unmistakably, <laughs> this is what we have. Beer holders are cool too, but uh, it's all good. Well, yeah, no, I'm using one. Well, kind of. Uh, it's not a beer koozie uh, per se. All right, so let's make sure that I am gonna. I'm, I'm giving you the right identity for your minis here. We're gonna open up Elemental Evil. All right. I don't know. Here's some stuff that's in you know bubble wrap. Whatever. <laughs> Here's the third bubble wrap figure. All right, so Delcorin, there is in fact a large miniature, as oxymoronic as that sounds, that's in here. And so I'm going to check the other three figures to see if any of these are rare. Uh, just in case, because you might get double rares or a large uncommon and a rare. But here, yeah, you're in for the bubble wrap. Really, Delcorin, for all of you out there, has just bought an ASMR session of me popping bubble wrap on stream. All right, so Delcorin, dun, 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 dun. are you ready? Actually, Del, didn't you want a fire finger earlier in the stream? It may not be a fire finger, but it is a fire figure. Now, just to be, uh, just to double check, uh, Delcorin. Yep, there's your fire elemental finger. The other three minis that are inside here are. I got to get a light because unfortunately they don't print in white text on the base of the uh, the models like they used to, nor do they put the rarity symbols on the bottom like they used to either. So I'm gonna grumble about that. All right, first up is a troglodyte. A troglodyte. An earth elemental.
and... Oh, hello. What are you? This is interesting. What are you? I gotta look this up. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Delcoran, are you ready? This, and this isn't a camera trick. This is an invisible Earth Genasi fighter. An invisible Earth Genasi fighter. This is listed as an ultra rare piece in the set. So what I will offer you, uh, Delcoran, is you can have the, whoop, it, I, it didn't break. Come on. You can have the invisible, uh, the invisible Earth Genasi fighter. So he has a crossbow on his back and he's wielding a sword in two hands. Or you can have the large uncommon. Since you did technically get a rare and a large uncommon, it's your choice which one you want to be for your box. Pew, pew, pew. I got you. No, you didn't. Roll for it. Yeah, I got a 14. Well, too bad. My AC is a 15. Ha, ha, ha. Wait a minute. Let me see your character sheet. No, uh, it's my character sheet. You can't see it. Well, you're dumb, and I don't like playing D&D with you. You know, Bill, that really hurts, okay? I have to put up with a lot on a day-to-day -day basis to just come here and... Isn't that how it goes? <laughs> All right, so you want the fire elemental. That means the invisible Earth Genasi uh, will go into the, the, like, the public available pool. Um, new box of elemental evil. There we go. Also, Delcorin, a couple of these are for you, okay, man? Only a couple. So congratulations, you have a large fire elemental, and um, and remember, uh, remember Delcorin, you still have a figure that's outstanding, um, a common, a, a, a tiny to medium common or uncommon figure that I can throw in with this uh, elemental from your first bid a couple days ago. You're mostly donating to keep the fun going while also hoping something that looks like a bow ranger would pop up. <laughs> I've given into the dark side. Uh, we are also a spirit walker, by the way. You cast commune with nature spell, but only as a ritual. When you do, a spiritual version of one of the animals you chose as a totem spirit or aspect of the beast appears to you to convey the information you seek. And, well, we're only 11th level, so we don't get the totemic attunement. But here we go, huh? Ah, uh, well, phew. good luck me getting War of the Dragon Queen, Bubonic. Delcorn, and thank you also for being a part of the fun and sharing in, in what we're doing here. Hey, some more bad and high. So now that we have our background, we have our race, and uh, we have our class features, let's drop the Hemi in this bad boy and rev up our Barbarian. Strength, Dex, and Con, I think, uh, I think to, to really go for this single-minded pursuit, we should actually limit our social or our mental skills and only have the proficiencies be our shining points of, of light in guiding our interactions. Meanwhile, we're going to hit everything else like a Mack truck. In fact, we can do something like... Uh, 
What if we put 15, uh, 15 con, 14 dex, 12 strength, 13 wisdom, because that's our social stat for animal handling, 10 charisma, 8 intelligence. That would give us a starting 16 dex and 16 con. And you're like, well, hold on a minute. Like, we're using a great axe. Yeah, we are. We can put... Uh, we're going to pump four points into this character also. Meaning that uh, when we take our level 4 and our level 8 stat bump, that can put our strength up to 16 as well. That's going to give us a 3 strength, 3 dex, 3 con, <laughs> minus 1 int. One Wisdom, zero Charisma. You want to talk about a singular focused um, character? Don't be afraid to put uh, profi skill proficiencies in abilities that you are, you're poor at, right? By the time the game ends, your proficiency bonus will matter a whole heck of a lot more than your ability modifier will. And what that means, if you create a character like this, is that they're not generally intelligent, but when it comes to religion, he is he is good at religion. He just doesn't know a lot about other aspects. So it's a point of light in the darkness, or the dimness otherwise. Don't be afraid to do that with your characters at home. If you're a smart character, if you're, if you're a wizard and you cast off intelligence and you take a, bu a bunch of intelligence skills, that's fine. You can do that, and you can be a super smarty pants specialized wizard. You'll be more successful than not. But if you want to spread it out a bit, or show that, yes, I have a general intelligence. You know, if you have an 18 intelligence, you're a solid generalist. You have a 4 in everything without having to specifically study it. But, if you take a dump stat in something, and you specialize, then you're at least good at that one thing. So you may not have a vast intelligence, but you're good at putting together clues. Right? We, we all have this personally, or people we know. A strong point. I'm not good at math or science, but I'm really good at English. Okay. That could reflect having a low intelligence, but a proficiency in the history skill, or something like that. So, encouragement for you all. Don't be afraid to try that. Uh, so with this, our strength saving throw is 7, con is 7, athletics is 3. 3 is down the line for dex. Um, religion's going to be a 3. Everything else, we're just going to copy and paste this uh, this number here. Whatever it is. <laughs> uh, wisdom, 1, 1, 1, 1. And the proficiencies are 5 and 5. And charisma is 0 down the line except for intimidation, which is going to be a 4. Uh, we put um, we put them in. Uh, we put the, the the four points. Or I'm sorry, the uh, it was at a twelve. We get two bumps. I'm sorry. So that should have been a uh, that should be a fourteen. I, I put I think I put in three stat bumps instead because we went fifteen and fourteen, thirteen, twelve. So yeah. Um, we put one set of stat bumps in con, and we put the other one in strength. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I ended up. I accidentally put in three stat bumps because I, I was thinking level 12. We only got two. One at four and one at eight. So thank you for bringing that up, Diadems. I wouldn't want to lead any of you astray. Our passive perception is 11 because that's 10 plus our perception modifier. We have an awareness about us. Is it the best? No, but eh. Congratulations! We can now give our Warforged a name. Let's take a look-see also. Um, our initiative, boom, plus three. Initiative is a dexterity check. Which, um, by the way, um, this is really good for a big brawler barbarian. Especially one that can come up at you, to come up on you with a great axe at at 45 feet on a normal move, let alone with this eagle ability to use a bonus action to dash, meaning we can move, 
bonus action dash and strike you twice with our extra attack. We can move 90 feet per round and attack twice. Woo! Our armor class, well... Hmm. This is interesting. Are we technically wearing armor with integrated protection? No, okay, I'm sorry. They, they do clarify it. Armor and armor. So if we just go with Darkwood Core, that's 11 plus your dex modifier. So normally that'd be 14. Now that does not stack with unarmored defense. What that would mean is we would add our three dex and our three con and add that to 10. And so we would get a 16 out of it instead. So it's our choice. If we go Darkwood Core, then we can be at a 16 or a 14 if for some reason we wanted a 14. But when we wake up, we have armor built into us. If we wanted, we could go medium armor and go 13 plus 2. So we could get a 15 if we went, uh, if we went that. And remember, too, shields... You can stack the shield bonus with unarmored defense, let alone this inbuilt protection that Warforges receive. Vinny VD might be a good name. Uh, as it has no sex connotation, the name would be uh, by the previous master who may have known Latin. So how about we take that? Uh, how about we take that concept, Zuler Pie? We could go something like uh, Veni Vidi, but as uh, the Warforged used to have numbers associated with them. What if it was like this? There's the first and last name of our Warforged. Veni Vidi. How about that? Is that a, do you like that idea? You know, to the friends, it's just, it's five or five any. Yes, uh, it is a religious Warforged pocket. And, and we could even go and do something like that. You know, it could be called uh, AKA uh, Chapel or Church. Makoki, a Warforged is a, um, it's a player character race of a, a living golem. Seraph wants to call her Jenny the Great Warforged Barbarian. <laughs> Something like that. Or even if, if it's a proper nickname. Hit points, at level 1, you get the maximum of 12 hit points, because that's your hit die. For the 10 other levels in our 11 level character, you get half plus 1 of your hit die, which is going to be 7. Right? Half of 12 is 6, plus 1 is 7. For all 11 levels, you get your constitution modifier in bonus hit points. Here's our simple math. Here's our 33, plus our 70. So here's 103, 105, 115. 115 hit points at level 11. And by the way, no dark vision. Who's rolling up at a possible 90 feet around to make two great axe swings on you. 
with an armor class of 16. And you know what? If they're raging, uh, if it or she is raging, all that uh, all that bonus uh, damage reduction, hit points for days, this thing is... Uh, this is a Terminator. I mean, a, a good classic T-100. Right? It doesn't fatigue from motion. It, it doesn't... It needs downtime, but it doesn't really sleep. All right. To hit things as hard as we can. Whoops, I'm sorry. Strength is a 2. I had a 14. My bad. 2 plus proficiency. We're swinging at a plus 6. And javelins are a, str are a thrown weapon, and so you use your strength on thrown weapons. Great axes, 1d12, uh, plus 2, slashing. Light crossbows, 1d8, plus 3, as that is a dexterity-based weapon piercing. And by the way, not only, not only can Chapel roll up on you with a melee weapon... Chapel can snipe at you with ranged weapons and be arguably, well, not even arguably, and be more proficient and more damaging with ranged weapons. Javelins are 1d6 plus... Uh, ooh, I gotta look this up. I think throne is an option. Is throne an option or a requirement? If a weapon has the thrown property, you can throw the weapon to make a ranged attack. Okay. If the weapon is a melee weapon, you use the same ability modifier for that attack roll and damage roll that you would use for a melee attack. For example, if you throw a hand axe, you use your strength. But if you throw a dagger, you can use either your strength or your dexterity since the dagger has the finesse property. Okay, so a javelin would use strength. So that's actually going to be a plus 7 to hit with a plus 3 modifier. Javelin's a 6. And Javelin does require strength, and that's going to be a 2 piercing. There we go. Long, medium, and melee ranged combat expertise here. Uh, can see for a mile. Perfectly clear with those eagle eyes can just fly around through combat. Actually, that's another scary part. For as much movement as it has, you get disadvantage on um, on opportunity attacks. So if you're my DM and I'm piloting 5 any here, um, ooh, I'm going to be just... Uh, I'm going to be dicing up your goblins or whatever, just spinning in circles around them. In fact, I would probably bait all of your monsters out of their reactions to then let my my rogues or someone else come in and just do insane amounts of damage because you've already used your reactions on me and if you and if you haven't and you're hanging on to it then you're letting me run around the playground freely and that's a dangerous thing for a barbarian like this to do you can call him chappy or chap yep which is interesting because there's supposedly a female soul inside this Warforged, though it does appear to be very neutral in expression. Such is the fun you can have. Make the noises stop. Make the noises stop. Make the noises, noises, noises. Make the noises stop. Can you imagine hearing that in that, that sort of monotone as it's running around just slaughtering everything? Oh my gosh. All right, so there we go. There's our beautiful three-year-old character. Everyone, congratulations. Chapel turned three years old. No spells. We don't... Well, I mean, we, we get, like, spell-like abilities from Barbarian, but that's kind of contained up here. Um, there we go. We, have, we now have a party of Eberron-specific uh, racial characters. We have Blarod... Our Berserker Barbarian Changeling, female. Valakad Nari here, our male Kalistar, uh, fight, uh, Paladin slash Fighter. We have Meryl Saberclaw, our female Long Tooth Shifter, who's a life cleric and, and a bit of a zealot, if I may say so myself. And now we have Five Any, or Chapel, who, um, oof, yikes. 
And this is a very religious themed party, by the way. I think we're going to have some fun with the Pantheon of Eberron tomorrow night. That's right, you're three, now go get a job, you Warforged hippie. Get out of your mad scientist lab, come on, get off that, uh, that lightning platform. <laughs> the downside of 580 is no dark vision, so does the team need a torch or equivalent? Uh, Meryl has dark vision. However, Kalistars, Changelings, and Warforged do not. With kind of an exception... Let's go over here. You, as a Warforged, can buy components as magic items. The Warforged are living constructs. House Caneth has designed a number of magic items that can interface directly with the body of a Warforged. Once attached, a component cannot be removed unless the Warforged allows it. Pocket Punch, thank you very much. The Arm Blade is an example of an item created by House Caneth. Dawsons are mysterious, wondrous items discovered in Zendrick. These are just a few of the components that can be encountered in the world. Um, so what you can do here, if you are a Warforged... Um, let's see. I think you can get things like... Um, a lamp on your head to provide light. Arm blade is a weapon designed to integrate with the forearm of a warforged. If you're a warforged, you can attach an arm blade by attuning to it. An attached arm blade cannot be disarmed or removed from you against your will. But while the weapon is attached to you, cannot use that hand for other actions. You can spend one minute to end the attunement and remove the arm blade. It isn't inherently considered to be a magic weapon for purposes of overcoming DR. However, any sort of magical melee weapon that could be created as an arm blade, so you could acquire a vicious arm blade or a vorpal arm blade if you wish. Um, and if your DM allows, again, you could probably get, uh, you could buy, uh, like, goggles of dark vision that exist in the DMG, and, and it's turned into um, a Warforged component that you can purchase, and then you just pop out your eyeballs and you put the new improved ones in and now you can see in the dark as a warforged chapel wants you to remember to donate to your local deity so she can make the voices stop <laughs> thank you pocket uh why not have a permanent light spell cast on the crystal that's hung on its chest you could do that too pat can't you tie a torch to him sure makoki if you want to be practical about stuff come on sheesh this is D D. how dare we talk practicalities <laughs> All right. Here's our four characters. We have a very cool party of Eberron themed characters. A changeling, a Kalistar, a shifter, and a warforged all walk into a bar. I'm going to get up and uh, I'm going to get up and take a little bit of a break, 5 minutes or so, um, to just refresh myself, you know, get some water, uh, Answer nature's call. Speaking of which, and uh, to uh, or to uh, five itty or five any here. Um, you all do the same. Let's take a short rest, and we'll come back, and we'll see what the night holds for us. Okay, everyone.